midweek series about uh, what we're talking about family, right? And uh, the whole idea of having us all together is to create culture. Understanding that culture is created when everyone pitches in and supports. That when we're talking about dating, we want everyone to support that culture. We want our singles to be able to have the marrieds as a reference and as advisors and as confirmation to go, hey, do these principles actually work? Amen. And you can see uh, the, the nods or the people that have gone there and have gone ahead of you and learn from them and go, man, what does it take? Because the world says it's impossible. Uh, it doesn't work, it, you, you know, that sin has to be involved, but then we can look at uh, the great marriages that we have here. And then uh, last week we talked about marriage. And obviously marriage is such a broad topic. We talked specifically about communication and kind of how conflict escalation happens. And conflict escalation can end at any point. But we talked about the four points. It starts with criticalness, criticism, which we've all done. And we don't have to start there, but even if it does go there, we can respond by taking responsibility as opposed to defensiveness, right? And, and then from defensiveness, it, it grows to contempt, anger, and hatred, right? And then from that, it grows to where we explode or we stonewall. And I was really encouraging the symbols that, hey, this isn't, these principles aren't just for married people. That, that if you understand the principles, like physics, like people that made pyramids thousands of years ago, they exist today because they're based on principles of science and physics that never grow old. In the same way, when we look at the scriptures and we dig out the principles of relationships, well, you know, you open your eyes. This can apply to your friendships as well. It can apply to the roommates that you have. And rather than saying, you know what, I just can't get along with this person. Just saying, man, what can I do to make this better? And so we talked about uh, marriage. But again, there was something there, hopefully, for all of us. And today, we're going to talk about parenting. Again, such a, uh, such a broad topic. And, and again, but sp we're going to narrow it down specifically to this idea of Discipline and training your child. A couple things. If you're single, there's two things you can take. One, store this stuff up away. I, you don't want to be, you know, five, ten, whatever years from now when you got kids. Oh, man, I wish I paid attention. And I can tell you honestly, the greatest parenting lessons I got was when I was in college watching my evangelist train and disciple his baby, his baby children. Who are now grown adults and married to disciples. But I remember I saw it and I had the privilege to kind of ultimately see the fruit of it. Secondly, the principles involved in training apply to children, but quite frankly, they apply to adults as well. Come on. And I think for those of us that don't have kids, I think a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about, that they're lessons in leadership for all of us. Okay, so these are things that if you are looking for wisdom, you'll find it. And if you're not, well, you, you won't find it. <laughs> and so, and as we talk about discipline, I want to start with this by saying that we, and whenever we're, we're talking about these topics, and, and I've mentioned this before, when we talk about disciplining in the context of our children, we want to avoid all extremes. Right? The Bible talks about the fool, you know, just a man who fears God, a man who honors God, avoids extremes. And so one, we don't want to be disciplinary in where it defines the relationship to the point where you go, oh, I knew a strict parent and he was just abusive. Yeah, well, we don't want that. But we also don't want, you know, a parent that's like, you know, bargaining with a four-year-old and the four-year-old is terrorizing the parents. He's like, yeah, Billy, I thought we had an agreement. Well, you know, we don't want that either. Because you, if you're a parent, and I know there's a lot of new and young parents, you have an obligation by God, and that's what we're going to look at, to train and discipline your child. Yeah. And so we all have to understand that th this isn't stuff that's just made up by a, a dude. This is instruction by God. But these principles can apply to how we look at leadership or discipline in general. So these are, these are from the Bible. So the first passage I want to look at here is in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24. It says, whoever spares the rod hates their children. But the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. And so I think there's two words here. There's one that obviously discipline happens. But then it says that they're careful to discipline. 
and there's been many times as a parent where I disciplined my kids and I wasn't careful about it. And I'm specifically going to address the ages of 10 years and younger. Because quite frankly, when you're older than that, it's just a whole different ballgame. It, it just is. And, and the simplest way I'd explain that is when you're, the kids are young, you need to lead with authority. And as they get older, you need to lead with influence. Okay, and, and it's, it's like the graph that slowly goes down. Authority goes lower, lower, and lower. And then influence, you shouldn't be your kid's friend at three. They have nothing in common with you, okay? There's just literally nothing in common. You're the boss, you're always right at when they're three. And uh, you know, you should be leading by authority. But, but then obviously, as they get older, if you don't start leading by influence, you're gonna embitter them. So, the context of me talking about discipline today is about kids that are 10 years and younger. And we're gonna flush out some of these uh, concepts. But before I do that, this is very important that we address this concept of discipline. So I'm gonna read a passage here from Ezra chapter three. This is a time where God's people in his, in his, in his temple and his, was in ruins. And so they rebuilt the temple of God. It says, and all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. That's funny. So you have this situation in the history of Israel where they were laying down the temple, and you have this odd scene where the old people were crying and the young people were fired up. And uh, two weeks ago, we had the remembrance of 9-11. And what I want to talk about is kind of sort of the generational gaps that we have in regards to discipline. When 9-11 had happened, my grandparents were all alive. And I remember my grandparents' response to it when 9-11 had happened. And I was uh, in the college, work, my wife and I were working in the college ministry at the time in Canada. And it gripped the whole nation of Canada as well as America. Obviously it's our neighbors, it was a world attack. It was an attack on humanity. My grandparents were like, well, let's get them back. They need, to do, they need to bomb the heck out of those guys. But my grandparents grew up in a time of war. My grandfather was participated in World War II. My mother heard about the attacks on 9-11 and proceeded to vomit. And she told me, and she looked miserable. My parents grew up as children during the Korean War. During the Korean War, the North Koreans came in, and if it wasn't for, for the U.S., they were going house to house. They saw a hill, my father told me about, that was near their house, that later they saw dead bodies. And so when my mom heard about it, she vomited. When I heard about it, my friends and I were fascinated. We tried not to be inappropriate, but it was the first time my generation had seen an act of war. And my kids are learning about 9-11 from their teachers who were kids at the time that it happened. I share this to say that every generation has had its own response. And our generations form how we view things. You know, the generation that was older than me, they viewed discipline as like, man, we gotta do it. This was a hard working generation. But unfortunately, that generation often didn't have great relationship with their fathers. This current generation is so anti, oh no, we just gotta do, I'm, no, we gotta take care of little Billy, we're not gonna, they're more connective and relational, but they're less hardworking as a generation. They're less reliable, and, I, what, and what I'm trying to tell everybody is, we all are, we're all formed our views on this topic through many, through many biases in our generation. And what I want to do is say, listen, we've got such a, a wide range. We've got teens and college students and single people. We've got people that are older than, you know, my, my, my dad's age and, and older. But let's put all that aside and look at what the scriptures teach about it. Right? Because every generation is going to have its view, whether it's on war or it's on discipline. But what's not important is kind of our, our, our generational view. Because what we know is that the principles in the scriptures are timeless. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're timeless. And I always get amused when someone goes, hey, the Bible's out of date. I always ask that person, when did it become out of date? Like five years ago? <laughs> like it's been good for 3,000 and then just in 19, you know, in 2012, you thought it became out of date. 
And the joke is because it is timeless where you're studying. And so as I look at discipline here, let's look at, I want to show a, a short 50 second video of a kid crying and I want to make a point. It's okay, a little cute. So first of all, I want to make clear, I would not deal with my kids crying that way. <laughs> but the point I want to make is that the kid didn't have to cry. Okay. That, so, and, and I'm gonna just going to share some of, some of the things that, that I saw and did. But if my kid, like kids use crying as a means of control. You have to know. No, that doesn't mean every time they cry, but if you're a parent, trust me, you'll know the difference. <laughs> but you can't be controlled by the kids crying. You have to exert leadership. There are times when the moral imperative that God holds you to is to assess and to lead the situation. If somebody is dying there with a heart attack and you just go, oh, I don't know what to do. You are guilty of sin there. Because there, that, that, that the, there is something moral that you're required to do. You can't, being a fool, doing nothing, that's sometimes sinful. You know the good you ought to do and you don't do it, that's oh. sinful. And God holds parents responsible for training and disciplining their children. Yeah. Okay? Again, we don't want to be changed, but you still have to think of that. And so you... You know, you want to be able to use the resources. And there's two resources God provides. His word for me and the church. Okay. Now, I just want those that are young parents and I want those that are single to just get a view. Church, raise your hand if you've, if you've got kids that are 10 years and older and you credit the church for teaching you how to raise and discipline your children. Okay, so, so look around, and you're going to look at people that go, wow, I didn't, and the reason, thank you, you can put your hands down, the reason most of it is because we recognize we were messed up. So we didn't just go, well, this is what I think. We said, man, I better get input on this. Because if I, you know, everyone says, I want my kid to be better than me, but if I actually want to actually make that happen, I better figure out what I'm doing. I better figure out what, and that's careful to discipline. And I think of this passage when I look at that little girl. Don't withhold discipline from a child. If you punish them with the rod, they will not die. <laughs> so, training looks different at each age, okay? When our boys were first born, our first born uh, was uh, training for the first nine months involved putting them on a sleep schedule, meaning that we decided when the child sleeps, not the child. The child doesn't decide and tell us when we're going to feed it. The child is, ah, feed me. We were going to put this child on a schedule. Now, when we, Ruth and I first did that, we were first time parents. I get it. I get the, the scariness of being a first time parent. And we put, and then all these people are like, no, you, you, you do not let the, that child goes to bed. And, and if it screams, you let it scream. And we're like, ah. so we put you know, a little baby in there. And we put him in there. He's like, ah, ah, ah. Ruth's literally crying, I can't leave him. Like, we've got you. This is what we're supposed to do it. And by the time we had a third, it was like, all right, just leave him there. I'll stop crying in about 20 minutes, but this is an old hat for us. So I understand it's an emotional process because you love that little nugget like anything. And we went through it. We were like, oh, this is my world. And, and, but, but that, but you have to lead that child. And then after nine months, we, we started to introduce 
a measure of physical discipline. Now it's a little, little baby, so we would just slap its finger. You know, like, not, I mean, no touching that light socket. And again, you feel terrible because then you look at this and go, huh? right? he, he didn't die, I have a news for you. 17, 15, and 12, they, they, didn't, they didn't die. You know what I'm saying? They didn't withhold it. And then later on, when they were old enough, and this is where you get advice, and with each person, it's going to look a little different. We started to take a little wooden spoon to their bum bum. And when you smack a child on their bum bum, it stings and hurts them. I got news for you, they don't die. Okay, and we're talking a little bit about practicals of that. Okay, so I'll look at this passage here. It says, one, uh, my son, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. Don't lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as a son. Now, um, I understand some of us have a very tough context for discipline. Some of us, if not many of us here, the only form of discipline we received was abusive. If we did something wrong, we were told you're a stupid idiot, uh, or physical discipline was too extreme. And I understand that, you know, we're all come, we come from a broken world. But what I encourage people to do to reframe, whether it's generational bias or racial cultural bias, to reframe ourselves as I just say, study it out in the Bible because God disciplines. Come on. This is part of the character of God. God disciplines you because he knows it's good for you. He knows it changes you. He knows that this is what trains you. Now, uh, is Danielle here? Danielle Williams, Danielle. Right. Danielle, there she is. Okay, I'm gonna get Danielle to come on up here. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just gonna introduce Danielle and I'm gonna ask her a couple questions. So Danielle, first of all, if you don't know Danielle, Danielle is uh, in the campus ministry. She is what I, what I would consider an awesome disciple. She loves people, she uh, reached out to her roommate, baptized her roommate, she's she shared, she's, yes, yes, Ryan right there, Ryan Espen. She, she's, uh, to me, she's just a wonderful example. If I had a daughter, I would want her to be like Danielle, okay? She's relational, she's connective. And uh, I just have so much admiration for this young woman, okay? Now, she's also a kingdom kid and was raised in the church. And so I guess one of the questions I wanted to ask Danielle and talk a little bit about what you can share uh, is your thoughts about your parents' discipline. So did your parents discipline you, first of all? Yes, they did. Okay, so can I ask, you know, just for the sake of the, uh, what did that look like? Can you just kind of describe a little what that looked like? Um, so I think, I'm not really sure what age it started, but I know it started as like pats on the hand. Uh -huh. um, and then eventually my parents kind of, I graduated to um, a small painter stick from Home Depot on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And then I think by the time, um, probably like three or four, once I was a little bigger, right. um, they started using like a bigger Home Depot. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> so. And do you remember why they would do that? Like what, what would be a reason that uh -huh. we'd get that? Or like, do you remember doing something or what would yeah. they respond? Being just deliberately disobedient. Usually there was like a warning, and then after, like, I went against that and kind of did my own thing because I'm pretty independent right. um, in nature. Um, they, they would get the stick, so. Right. And uh, sometimes they'd have me go get the stick, so. <laughs> <laughs> that is just ridiculous. Uh, so, can you share your personal thoughts or convictions now? Obviously, you can give your. She's going to the University of Michigan. She, she's, she's just a, she's a wonderfully uh, accomplished young lady. She's got a full ride out there. Uh, she's dating, she's, uh, she's a disciple. Uh, you know, I, I think it, it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say most parents would be proud to present Danielle as your daughter, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on discipline and your personal. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't know, I would say that discipline is important taught me that there are consequences to my actions, both good and bad. Um, and so even now, like going forward, I know that when I choose something that's against God's will, and he's made that evident to me, either through his spirit or through the scriptures, I know that there's gotta be a consequence. Um, so I think even now, just like seeing um, when a child is disruptive, kind of in public or different things like that, and there is kind of that negotiation, I'm like, it just looks ridiculous because you're teaching that child that it's okay for them to act a certain way and still get what they want. Um, when I've been taught through discipline that that's not the case. Right. Um, Excellent. And then uh, 
did you ever, like obviously you bump with, I mean, you're a normal person, you were all sinners, you bump with your parents. Do you ever feel, was there ever an argument between you and your dad now that you're an adult? Like, I'm bitter because you spanked me when I was five. Has that ever been an issue? No. Okay. All right. Thank you, Danielle. I just wanted to be a little interested. I think the other thing is, I think she's a grown woman looking and saying she too can discern and go, yeah. And, and, and I think for my boys as well, when we see a kid in the mall that's lying flat down and the parents like, we gotta go. <sighs> All right, I guess we're staying, you know, and stuff like that. That is not how disciples raise their children. I want to make clear that that we we are safe. We accept each other. We love each other. We work through our weakness, but we also have an obligation to be a light. Yeah. We have an obligation to be a light in our parenting, and we have an obligation in our marriages, and all these things. And I, I know we're all in different spots in our journey, but again, this is, I want to talk about this so that we understand the culture we want to see. And so it says this, train a child in the way they should go, and even when they're old, they will not turn from it. And again, the thing that I want to encourage you is that the way the cycle parenting work looks at their children is, discipline is not punishment, it's training. Yep. And it's a fundamental paradigm shift from how the world views it. So my parents, whom I love and have a great relationship, they're not disciples, but I love them dearly. And uh, uh, they, they, they're Asian, so they discipline me with a wooden spoon. But it was most often punishment, right? Now, it was sometimes training too, but a lot of times it's context. And so I had to reframe it. And so when I've not been careful in parenting my children, I've disciplined them in anger as punishment <laughs> because you upset me, and that's wrong. Right. And I think as a parent, what you do in those situations is you pull your kid aside and you say, I'm sorry, daddy was angry. And when I've, parent, when I've spanked them and their mom, a lot, a lot of times I've just said, yeah, buddy, I'm so sorry. I've, I've given them hugs, like, I love you. But you, this is what happens when you punch your brother in the head. You get a spank. <laughs> <laughs> you understand that? Yeah, I don't really know. It's, I know we might have deserved it, but you get the spank, okay? You do it and it's over. And you give them a hug when it's over, you show them you still love them afterwards, right? But you still train them because now they go, oh, wow, I'm not going to do that anymore. I want to read. Um, so one of the books I can recommend, and this is for me personally, this is just an opinion, is the series, especially for young parents, but it's called Baby Wise. They, they have Baby Wise, Toddler Wise, it's a series, Child Wise, and Preteen Wise. It's the, it's the, and then team wise, but I would say the first four books are outstanding in terms of teaching parents. And if, if you're gonna get the book, I always tell the dads, make sure you read it too. You don't want your wife to have all this conviction, you know, like, hey, I'll think about it. But read it with your wife so that you guys are both on board with parenting. And I wanna read just a small excerpt uh, from this book. Got to navigate this one day. Yeah. Okay. It says, there are four capacities children have. They have physical capacities. Duty of every parent is to nurture, provide for its children's physical growth, well-being, right? Feed, clothe. Children have intellectual capacities. Duty of a parent is to stimulate this child's intellectual competency. Educate their children in basic skills, logic, useful knowledge. Children have emotional capacities. Right? The duty of a parent is to nurture a child's emotional well-being. Parents help their child establish internal controls, both positive and negative emotions. And lastly, children have moral or spiritual capacities. The duty of a parent is to help his or her child internalize virtues that reflect the values of family and society. Right? All four facets receive attention. None should be neglected because you don't want, because competency and character go hand in hand. You don't want to raise a smart child that lacks integrity. You don't want to raise a smart, uh, you, don't, uh, you don't want to raise a great athlete that's shallow intellect. You don't want academic skills without values, or, you know, or values without healthy emotions, or happy feelings without productivity, or physical stature without moral wisdom. And so, of these four capacities, which is the most important? What's the best order to arrange them? A small percentage of parents put intellectual stimulation at the top of the pile. Everything else is secondary to the child's cerebral development. When block, when you arrange their development this way, the child's character and emotions are usually left underdeveloped. 
Second arrangement is, represents the lion's share of modern parenting. It considers a child's emotional development as the first priority in training. Morality and academics are dependent on it. The theory is that if a child can be made to feel good about itself, they'll turn out great. By the way, they will not. Okay. They will not. It actually says they will not. And I echo that. Some parents think, think physical development deserves the top position. They enroll their children in all the aerobics, peewee, football, swim teams, weightlifting. Certainly parents should encourage their children in this area. Most kids develop physical skills, honestly, just by being. So then how should you stack the blocks? We believe that the moral, spiritual education should be the priority of early training. It's absolutely essential for optimal intellectual and emotional development, as well as the advancement of natural skills. Moral training gives children advanced modes of thought that is more easily transferred to both the intellect and emotions than any other form of education. Moral training provides objectivity needed for emotions to function freely without overpowering the child. I won't read it all, but it's saying that of all the things that transfer, like you can learn integrity from sports, but you can also not learn integrity from sports. We see that in athletes. But they're saying if you teach a child and you put the fundamentals on their spirituality and their morality, they will learn work ethic. They will learn self-denial. They will learn to push harder in that soccer game. They will learn to persevere in their academic studies. Because you placed the blocks in the right order. You put the emphasis for the child on the spiritual and moral development. And as disciples, that's what we believe. God said, and you know, it's funny, this is like psychologists. Thousands of years ago, thousands of years ago, God said, you teach your people about me. You teach your kids about me, to follow me, and to love me. Everything else will be good with your kids. Just do that. Uh, I think thousands of years ago, God knew what he was doing. It's not something that grew old. So you look at this, and it says, um, here's why making them emotionally better is not going to help. Because folly is bound in the heart of a child. They have something innate in them that you and I have innate in us. It's called sinful nature. <laughs> Right? So just making sure that their self-esteem is good is not going to get rid of their sinful nature. And for all of us, till the day we die, we are managing our sinful nature. We're battling our tendency to be critical. We're battling our tendency to be an introvert. We're battling our tendency to be lustful. We're battling our tendency to lie. I have had teens, teenagers that are disciples say, you know what? I'm not just gonna, I'm, for a whole week, I'm just not even gonna look at my phone. Why? I, I just, I feel like it's distracting me and I wanna be more focused on people and God. Mm. Where, where does a teen learn that? Because early you teach them that, and his own volunteer, like he's trying to be more spiritual. That's, and you go, wow, that's, where, where does a teen, where does a 15, where does a 13 year old get that conviction? Yeah. I've been to camp where I've seen 10 year olds go, Mr. King, yeah. I really need to confess some stuff I've done Mercy. to you. <laughs> There's 50 and 40 year old men that don't have the guts to do that. <laughs> Where does a 10 year old have the integrity to tell the truth in their heart? That's more important than doing a quadratic equation, people. Yeah. Why did they learn that, right? Because early you train them because folly is sin is bound up. And early you're giving them the tools to recognize sin in their heart fight that. Amen? Amen. This is what Danielle said. A rod and reprimand impart wisdom. You have a great talk with your kids after you spank them. After you wipe away their tears. You know, depending on their age. You know, if they're uh, you know, when the kids would, the boys would flop when they're getting their diaper changed. You know, no, no, no. You're like, alright, that's it. Stop, stop. Okay, let me spank them. And they don't really, they don't speak English at the time, they speak baby. <laughs> You're like, no, okay, no flopping. You'll be amazed how smart they get and how quickly they get smart when you start, dis when you start disciplining their child. You, they, they, these kids, they start operating at a higher level, just right away, once discipline becomes a part of their life. And you're like, you're not chasing around the mall. You tell that child to come here, and if it doesn't come, you train them. 
Expectations, let me be really clear here. Expectations means that you know what you're going to do when those expectations are not met. Yeah. That's what it means. Otherwise, if you don't know what you're going to do, it's called a hope. I hope my child behaves well. Great, so do I. I expect my child to behave well. That means you know what you're going to do when they don't behave well. Right. That's what an expectation means. And so you have to develop healthy ways to train and to discipline your child. Right? Oh, right. Um, so I'm going to close off here and uh, with this. is So why, when, and how? And again, I'm just one person, and I really want to encourage uh, parents uh, that to, to seek out some of the parents that have navigated. I mean, we've got people like Doug and Donna War, and we've got, you know, Danny Carey. We've got so many great families here that I know would love it if you just said, hey, how do I get my kid on a, on a schedule? Well, Ruth and I never figured any of this out ourselves. We just come from such, she comes from like a, a, a third world country where there's five kids running around, and I came from a strict oriental background, you know, I just, you know, got beaten with chopsticks. And we just what do we do? <laughs> what do we do? And and we and so many people are saying, here's what it looks like, you know, and, and there's a girl named Keisha. Keisha Barrett that said, Ruth, do I'm just like, I'm up all night. She goes, no girl, no, don't you you put that kid on a schedule, right? We're like, okay, okay. And that's what happened. But somebody really challenged us to be Christians in our parenting. That we're not gonna give in to whatever our generation told us. We're not going to give into what our culture told us. We're going to give into what the Bible tells us. Yeah. Because in that, there is wisdom. So why would, it, why would we discipline our children? And again, this is very specifically 10 years or younger. Okay? Uh, again, let's talk to some older parents and, and people that have navigated their kids through the teen and college years. Uh, that's a very different thing. And, I, and if you have kids older than, than 10, I really want to encourage you to get a lot of input because a lot of conversations have to happen and discipline yeah. needs to look differently. Yeah. Yeah. But for 10 and younger, why would I get to that? You heard it with uh, Danielle. If they're disobedient and they're disrespectful. Okay, you've got it. It's, 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 not, it's not rocket science. Why would you do it? When, when, if, when their <coughs> obedience teaches, it teaches kids how to listen, it teaches them self control, it teaches them emotional intelligence. You, you, I mean, have you seen an adult that was never disciplined by their parents? They're like, like, they're like lazy, emotionally distraught bums. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I, I feel tired, therefore I'm not going to go to work. What do, what do you mean you're not going to go to work? What are you in your mind? Get to work, you bum. Like, because you don't feel like it. Where, where did you learn that? Uh, I don't know. My parents gave me everything they wanted. You know, like yes, exactly. Right? That's that's gross to people. Yeah. Right? <coughs> Obedience teaches listening skills. Respect is important to train our kids. And, and I will say this, listen, everyone, if you've got if you've had kids, at, at some point your kids have embarrassed you publicly, and it's important you don't overreact in the moment. Right. <laughs> there are times where you're like, your kid will run here and you're like, stop, and you're like, it's okay. We get it. We're all working there. There's no we're, we're safe here. We're not, no one should feel embarrassed about their kids. Our children all love each other's children. What you do in public is you go, I'm working on it. And I'm like, totally. We're all in a different place. Okay. I'm just saying at home, you know, and, and you, you're training your kid to be respectful, to acknowledge adults. You know, when our kids were young, they called everyone Mr. and Mrs. They never called them by their first name. Now, that's just me. There's other parents that do it differently. That's fine. Right? Like one of my best friends, Chris Zillman, he had his kids call me Mr. Mark. I called, he, my kids called him Mr. Zillman, but they never called us Chris and Mark. And that was just our decision. No, that's not a king, that's just, that's just me personally. But the heart of it was to teach my kid respect. And, and what you do is you equip your kids with the ability to have relationships. Relationships are maintained and strengthened through respect. As we know, love is not enough for a relationship, right? You have to have, marriages break down not because of love, because of respect. You know what I'm saying? Friendships break down not because of love, because that's why we say things. Oh, I love them, but I can't stand them. <laughs> You've broken respect barriers there. And when you teach a kid to be respectful, you've taught them how to make friends. So when my, you know, my son doesn't walk up to someone and go, "Hey, nice shoes, they stink," right? You know those guys that like you meet them for the first time and they're critical. You're like, dude, get some relational skills. 
meeting me for the first time is not the time to be disrespectful, right? It's like, I get it, close friends can do that, but I just met you. <laughs> so the thing I can, you know, disciples can pride their kids on is, my kids know how, like my boys, yes, my boys are always, just like me, they're always gonna be a work in progress, they're always gonna be working on things. They know how to be friends and how to make friends because at an early age you teach them how to be respectful. Yeah. When people are, everyone wants to be friends with somebody that's respectful to you. It's the guy that's snooty and sits like this, and when you enter the room, let them say hi to you, oh, that kid's bad. Yeah. Why? Because he's disrespectful, yeah. right? It's, it's an insufferable person. Um, so it teaches the relational tools, and I gotta, I gotta wind up here in a minute here. Um, and then, uh, you, know, you know, when and, and the how, like I said, so I'm sharing all that, like, so when they're, Babies and brand new, the training consists of putting them on a sleep schedule. That's what it consists of when they are, and, I, and different parents, some parents start at six months, some parents start at, at nine months. So we started like what, nine months where we just tapped their hand, and it hurt when they didn't look at you. You had to be hard enough to just get, get two fingers, no touching that, right? But then pretty soon, guess what, right? I don't have to, I, all I have to do is say no, and I don't have to try, and they're like, okay. I don't want you to do that, right? And then pretty soon, and honestly, Ruth and I could, you know, and, and Carolyn will babysat our kids. And she's like, how did you get your boys? We could just walk in a mall. It's, boys, come here. And they'd all come rushing to me. And was, was, what is it? They're not born like that. They're trained to be like that. <laughs> like, you hear, they know, if I don't come, I'm getting this back. Therefore, I'll come. Right? It's just basic human training. Both parents have to be on board. Right? Both parents have to be on board. But, so, but training can happen, uh, like I said, it, it can happen the minute they're born, and how, it depends on the age. Like I said, it started with a sleep schedule, it progresses to a tap on the hand, and it ends with a little bump spank, and then we stop spanking the boys at 10, for some of them nine, just, by that time they know the deal, and a lot of times parents are like, yeah, honestly, they haven't even done anything spank worthy for like, since they were age. Uh, which is pretty common with kingdom kids, because they kind of figure out the rules, but then we have to navigate a whole different discussion. And the way that, but you can part, you can, and I'll close with this thought, you can kind of break parenting goals into three sections depending on their age. So the early age, the focus should be their behavior, okay? It should be their behavior. And as they kind of navigate that sort of eight to 12 years, you're trying to navigate their attitudes about things. Yep. And then when they get into that teen and preteen years, what you're trying to do is you're trying to instill desire. Because yep. the behavior doesn't matter if the desire is not. It's not a victory to get your team to church if they don't want to be there. But if they want to be there and they can't be there, you don't feel bad because you're like, yeah, but they wanted to be there. They wanted to do, they wanted to pray. They wanted to do what was right. And, and so you want, and that's the joy of a parent is that your kids want God, yeah. right? And so that's a whole new ball game and one that, that, that's something we can navigate later. But what I would say for young and new parents, your focus should be on getting your child to behave Properly. Yep. They should respect you. They should be obedient. Uh, this is something that God calls us to do with our kids. Amen? Amen. Let's have a prayer. We'll be done. God, damn it, thank you so much for uh, your instruction and that you call us to live lives that are holy and godly and encouraging and loving and inspiring. And thank you that, that you don't. Just expect things and not help us do it. You've, you've given us Jesus. You've given us an example. You've given us the word. And you've given us the church. You, you've given us each other as a community that, to help each other. And, and, and I know that you, this was always your vision for people. That we would love each other. That we would stand up like a light. That we would help each other. Whether it was in our walk with you or even raising our children. And I pray that this church can raise our kids in the light and the love and the knowledge of the Lord. That as you call us to, we can talk about you, we can teach our kids to love you. Please give us wisdom. Please give, put wisdom in our hearts. Give us convictions so that we can train our children to love and to follow you. We love you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Church, we're all dismissed. Don't forget to get your kids and uh, don't forget to train them as well. <laughs>